Inshallah, let's get started here. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And alhamdulillah, na'hamaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'akbiru. Wa na'uzu billah min shiruri anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. Man yahdihillahu falamudilla lah. Wa man yudlil falahadiya lah. Ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu. Wahdahu la sharika lah. Anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. Ya ayyuhal lazina amanatuka allaha. Hakka tukatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرهام إن الله كان عليكم مكيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم من يتي الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد my dear brothers and sisters all thanks and praises belong to Allah we seek Allah's help and forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves. Whosoever Allah guides can never be led astray, and whoso Allah leads astray can never find guidance. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is his messenger and his servant. O mankind, fear your Lord. He created you from one soul and created from its mate and dispersed from both of you, many men and many women. So fear Allah for whom you ask. And when you have believed, fear Allah and say words of appropriate justice, he will amend for you your deeds, forgive you your sins, and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has certainly attained a great attainment. Ameen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My dear brothers and sisters, our existence in this world is not a choice of ours. We didn't decide one day that we're going to be born on this earth on a specific day and time, or even the family. We didn't go through a selection process to decide who our mother is going to be or who our father is going to be. And we didn't decide the country or the circumstances within which we will be born. We also didn't choose the length of time you will have to live in this world. However, once we were created and life was breathed into us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, Allah also gave us free will and a purpose. And having both of these purpose and free will is part of our creed as Muslims. You know, we call it divine decree. And we believe that Allah has ordained for us a certain path and Allah has willed for us certain things. And how we act in those situations is where our free will comes in. So put it another way, if Allah SWT decides for us to be at a certain time and place under very specific conditions, it will come to pass. And we will be tested on what we do in that moment. All the trials and tribulations we have in this world are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so are all the wonderful things that we enjoy. We, as human beings, are both a terrestrial and a celestial being. Our bodies are terrestrial in that it is bound to this earth. Our souls are celestial because it is breathed into the body after a period of time in the womb. And to live in this world, to learn about our creator, that is part of our purpose. That is part of our mission, is to discover the purpose and live it for the duration we have in this, life, in this world. So our existence in this world is for the sake and pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how do we know this? We know this in the Quran, uh, in Surah Dhariyat, when Allah tells us, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةِ وَالْإِنسَىٰ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I did not create jinn and humans except to worship me. And this is in verse uh, 56. Our worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must be purposeful and with meaning. And we must learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we learn about Allah, we will find that our spiritual hearts will soften and that in turn will help us grow and grow closer to our creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when we learn about Allah, our hearts are inclined towards Allah. We purify our hearts when we spend the time remembering Allah. We bring ourselves to sukun or comfort when we orient our lives towards our creator. The way we learn about Allah is from the Quran and from the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in the Quran and the Hadith, we also learn about the attributes of Allah or what we call the names of Allah. And just as a reminder, there are 81 names of Allah that can be found in the Quran. The other 18 names or attributes come from the Hadith. And also depending on which scholar you study or which scholar you look at, you will find that the 99 names of Allah will differ just ever so slightly. We started down this journey some time ago discussing the 99 names of Allah. And today, inshallah, I will continue down this path uh, and talk about the attributes of Al-Mubdi and Al-Mu'id. And these names of Al-Mubdi and Al-Mu'id commonly appear together in the list of names compiled by scholars and commentators, including um, 
Al Ghazali. So Al Ghazali is the is the list that I've been following along so far, and these two names are commonly paired together in, in Al Ghazali's work. So the meaning of Al Mubdi is the originator, and the meaning of Al Mu'il is the restorer. So if we break it down to the the language part of this, the Mubdi Mubdi has a root word of Ba Dal Hamza, which has the meanings of uh, something new to begin something, and the root word for Mu'id is Ain Waw Dal, which has the meanings of, uh, you know, to resurrect or to repeat something. These two names paired together tell us about the beginning and the end. So the originator or Al-Mubdi tells us that Allah is the creator of all things. That is Allah created the universe and everything within it when there was nothing. Nothing existed before Allah created it and nothing that exists have come into existence without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other name, uh, the restorer, al muid tells us that Allah can bring anything back to life or repeat his creation any number of times. So nothing is impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah Al-Buruj, verse 13, we are told, Innahu huwa yubdi'u wa yu'id. For he is certainly the one who originates and resurrects all. And yubdi is a verb that means to originate, and yu'idu is a verb that means to resurrect. So Allah is reminding us that he subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator and the one who will resurrect us all on the day of judgment. On the last day, uh, the angel Israfil will blow the horn twice on Allah's command. The first time the horn is blown, all of creation will cease to exist. There will be nothing. It will be exactly like before Allah created anything in the universe. The second time the horn is blown, all of creation will be resurrected and brought to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for judgment. So if we remind ourselves about the articles of faith or iman. Uh, this goes back to the hadith, which I'm sure many of you have, have heard about, where Angel Gabriel comes to um, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, and comes to his gathering and, they, and all the Sahaba look at the, the, uh, you know, the uh, Angel Gabriel in that setting and they say, you know, this must be a traveler, but they don't see any signs of anything on him. So in that, in that um, exchange, one of the questions that Angel Jibreel uh, like, asks Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, you know, tell me about Iman. And then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us about the six pillars of Iman that we believe in. And the six pillars are uh, belief in Allah, belief in the angels, belief in the books of Allah, belief in the messengers, belief in the last day, and belief in the divine decree. So these six pillars are part of our Iman or part of our creed as Muslims. And we must understand and believe in them. Um, one pillar is no more important than the other. They're all important. However, when we look at the Quran and Sunnah, um, we find that the scholars will comment that two of these pillars are mentioned more often than others. And these are the pillars of the belief in Allah and the belief in the last day. So uh, if we have strong belief in, in these two pillars, we will find that the rest of these pillars will be fortified within us. And that is to say, our Iman, inshallah, will grow stronger. So a believing Muslim will strengthen these pillars in themselves to establish iman in their hearts. And when our beloved Prophet ﷺ was sharing the message of the Qur'an, there were many disbelievers who, uh, who would ask our Nabi ﷺ, you know, about the day of resurrection. You know, they would point to dead bones and carcasses and say, you know, who would resurrect us? On the, who would bring these bones back to life on the day of judgment? And our Prophet ﷺ would remind them that it was Allah who created them in the first place and resurrection uh, resurrecting his creation is not a difficult task at all. And we know this also from the Quran. So when we look at Surah Yasin, verses 79 to 83, that's the last uh, four or five verses in Surah Yasin. Uh, in verse 79, Allah tells us, Kul lazi awala marratin, wa huwa bikulli alim. Say, O Prophet, they will be revived by the one who produced them in the first place, for he has perfect knowledge of every created being. So Allah is telling the Prophet to tell the disbelievers that on the day of judgment, the one who created them will be the one who resurrects them. And right in the next verse, in verse 80, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an example. So Allah is being instructive uh, in, in this next uh, verse. Allah is telling us uh, about two trees that the Arabs used to use as firestones. And these two trees were known as Mah and Afar. Uh, so in this verse, Allah is telling us, He is the one who gives you fire from the green trees, and behold, you kindle fire from them. Allah min 
So if we know anything about trees, we know that when you see the tree is green, it still is full of life, it has moisture. Um, how is it possible that when a tree has moisture that you would use it as a firestone? And this is the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah created two different trees that you can strike together and use as firestones. But it doesn't stop there. The trees themselves serve another purpose beyond just using them as twigs to start fire. The trees serve as fuel for the fire to continue to glow, for the fire to continue to keep going. So we don't stop there with trees. There's so many more uses of trees other than just serving as fire starters or as fuels. We use them to build our homes. We use them to build other structures. And if it wasn't for trees, Allah's creation, past and present civilizations would probably have never sailed across the oceans or built communities in the lands in which they've established themselves. So in the verse following that in verse 81, Allah tells us, Can the one who created the heavens and the earth not easily resurrect these deniers? Yes, he can, for he is the master creator all knowing. And this is right after Allah is being instructive and giving us this example about the trees that Allah created. And if Allah can use this for so many different purposes, why can't he just create, uh, you know, resurrect them on the day of judgment? So if Allah can create the heaven and the earth, there's nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot create. And then Allah confirms this in the next verse by saying, All it takes when he wills something to be is simply to say it, be, and it is, kun, fayakun. That is it. Allah just has to say it and it will exist. And think about how much we struggle as people to create anything, even the simplest of things, even with something as simple as composing a thought in our mind. How much effort does it take for us to nurture that thought, rationalize it in our mind, and then find the words to articulate it in language that can be understood by the ones who are receiving this information? So if I just use myself as, a, as an example of this, you know, I had to put in that effort to think through what I'm about to say today and then make sure that whatever I reference is not going to misinform you. And that was not even original thinking because a lot of that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on what has been given to me. And there's many more other people out there who have significantly more knowledge than I do. Um, so then in the last verse of Surah Yasin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in verse 83, for subhanallah malakutu kulli shay'in. So glory be to the one in whose hands is the authority over, over all things and to whom alone you will all be returned. So Allah is reminding us in this last verse that we all came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will all return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We came from nothing and we will go back to the infinite. From nothing to the infinite. And in this time and age, there is a lot of focus on creating something from nothing or emphasizes self-made people or whatever self-made um, individual we wanna think about or talk about in, in this popular culture of ours. But we forget that it's impossible for something to come from nothing because we don't have that capability. So Allah is reminding us that the attributes of al-mubdi and al-mu'id are a way for us to reflect about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we cannot emulate these attributes, because we're unable to resurrect the dead, we don't have this ability. However, like all attributes and all names of Allah, there is something in there for us to learn. There's something in there for us to take away by reflecting on it. And if we think that the ideas we have or things that we build are from our own minds alone that we are forgetting at that point that we exist, Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even exists. Um, you know, we can't just create anything from nothing. Something has to exist. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided us the tools and the means to be able to use everything that is around us, to be able to put these things together in unique ways so that we can make use of them as we live in this world. And, you know, the knowledge that we possess, the knowledge that was decreed for us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how do we know this? We also know this from the Quran. And we know this in Surah Baqarah, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the angels that he is going to place humans on earth. 
So this is the story when Allah is talking about Adam in uh, verse 30. Allah tells the angels, I'm going to place um, someone on the earth. And, and the angels ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way of curiosity, will you place in it someone who will spread corruption there and shed blood while we glorify your praises and proclaim your holiness? So the angels are not questioning Allah. They're curious. They're curiously asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know that humankind is able to do all of these things. And we know that we're able to cause corruptions and shed blood. And here we are, we glorify your praises. So it's almost as if the angels are saying, you know, why aren't we being placed uh, in this earth? And again, angels are pure goodness. They only do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them to do. So how does Allah respond to the angels? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to the angels like, an instructor, a teacher would, giving them something firm followed by something instructive. So in the same verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the angels, Inni a'lamu ma la ta ma la ta I know what you do not know. And there's uh, some tafsirs around this verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 30, where it's been compared to uh, for example, the, the answer you would give to somebody who, for example, does not believe in the existence of Allah, doesn't, is an atheist, for example, or a polytheist. You know, wh why is there all these things happening in the world? And, and the answers to the angels was, I know what you do not know. So this was a firm statement that Allah gave the angels. Allah knows the secrets of the heavens and the earth, and Allah knows what the angels and anybody else don't know. And Allah then proceeds to instruct the angels after giving them this first firm statement. Um, you know, Allah asks Adam alayhi salam, Allah gives Adam alayhi salam certain pieces of knowledge, and then Allah asks Adam in this gathering to recite the names that he subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Adam alayhi salam. And after Adam recites the knowledge that was given to him, the angels responded, glory be to you. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us. You are truly the all-knowing, all-wise. And this is in verse 32. Um, in Surah Al-Baqarah. So what we, what do we learn from this exchange that, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the angels, you know, that to live on this earth, it's not a required, to, it's not a requirement to be pure like the angels. The angels are pure beings. They do exactly, if Allah tells them to do this, they will do that. You know, Angel Israfil, for example, is waiting there for the call on the day of judgment. So if Allah wanted angels to live in the earth, Allah could have easily done so. Allah could have given angels properties that Allah has given to humankind and, and said, go uh, populate the earth, go live in the earth. Now, but that's not what Allah did. And Allah could, have, Allah could have done that, but that's not what Allah did. Allah knows angels are obedient and do what Allah tells them. And Allah has given mankind the ability to learn and grow in knowledge on their own, but also give them the free will to make the kind of decisions that will um, characterize the content or, or rather, you know, show the content of their character. So we as human beings, we as humankind have the ability to both obey and disobey. We can learn as demonstrated by Adam al -Islam, and this ability to learn and grow is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what Allah is telling the angels that to live on this earth and to spread on this earth, you need that, that requirement. You need to have that ability to learn and grow. And there's so much more that we can learn from the Quran, you know, just by reflecting on it and reading and, and understanding from it and paying attention to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu because he is the Quran personified. How he lived his life is an example for both men and women in this world and in any community in this world um, for, for uh, you know, to look at a role model. And it's through the Quran that we learn about ourselves and how we must behave in this world. You know, we should think of the Quran as our operating manual. One of the well-known and accomplished jurists of Islam, Sheikh uh, Ibn Taylor, he wrote the book um, Kitab al-Hikam, which uh, translates to the Book of Wisdom. And in that book, um, Sheikh Ibn Taylor talks about, um, you know, different things. Um, it's, it's almost like, you know, sayings from... Uh, um, the sheikh himself that he's, he's you know putting together all of his knowledge, all of his wisdom into this one book. It's an interesting book to read if you get a chance. Um, but in this book, uh, he talks about 
that every state or hal of a person has a right over the person, just like there's rights that our neighbors have over us, there are rights our children have over us, our parents have over us, and so on. Each state of ours as an individual has a right or a haq over us. And the way we discharge these rights depends on if we're aligned with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. And this is very much in line with how we dispense with or discharge the rights that are upon us from our neighbors or from our children or from our spouses, uh, etc. So Sheikh Ibn Atayla says that there, a person can be in one of four states. Okay, A person can be either in a state of blessing or calamity, or they can be in a state of obedience or disobedience. And at any given point in time, we are going to be in one of these four states. So then the question is, how do we behave in accordance with what Allah has, has taught us? Or do we behave in a different way in, in what Allah's creation might want us to do? So when a person is in a state of blessing, the way we should behave is to be in a state of gratitude or shukr. So if we have sustenance, for example, if we have shelter and we have relative security around us, we should always be in a state of gratitude towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we find ourselves that we are in a state of calamity, what is that right that we must um, dispense with or execute? We have to be in a state of patience or sabr, knowing that blessings and trials and tribulations are all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are a test from us. And we should ask Allah for patience when we find ourselves being tried in this world. And it goes back to divine decree. Uh, you know, some of us might fall into the trap of believing that because it's been divinely decreed, there's nothing that I can do. And that is not the creed of a Muslim. And as believing Muslim, as practicing Muslim, we always believe that Allah's decree still allows us to, to execute our free will. And it's what we do in those moments of trial and tribulation is what Allah is going to ask us about on the day of judgment. So what about when we're in the state of obedience? How should we behave when we're in a state of obedience? We should be in the state of remembrance of Allah or performing the dhikr of Allah. And when we obey Allah and follow the sunnah of the Prophet, we are humbling ourselves and we are then in constant remembrance of Allah because we are living every breath and every moment in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might have decreed for us or might have want for us to do. And when we're in the state of disobedience, the only way to behave is to be in a state of repentance or istighfar. Asking Allah to forgive our transgressions, no matter how small or how large, asking Allah for mercy, asking Allah to show us leniency, not just in this world, but in the grave and on the day of judgment. And all these states are telling us that we should always be mindful about all the rights and responsibilities we have in this world, not just to our neighbors or our family members, but to ourselves as well. How much attention are we giving to ourselves? How much rights are we uh, keeping intact that are for us. So our lives should be ultimately guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we submit ourselves to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like when we have, you know, when small children have emotional awakenings, eventually spiritual awakenings, you know, even intellectual awakenings, all of this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Fatah, the opener. You know, Allah can open our hearts, can open our minds whenever he wills. And to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a struggle that each and every one of us will have for the rest of our lives. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took our beloved Prophet sallallahu away from this world, that was not the end of Islam. In fact, Islam will continue until the day of judgment because Allah left us the Quran. And this book of Allah will be with us until the day of judgment. And it will bear witness for us how closely did we connect ourselves with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if anything, it behooves us to learn from the Quran as much as we can and to connect with the Quran as much as we can and as often as we can. And these are the words from Allah in the Quran and it contains many dimensions of knowledge. Some of them are accessible to the lay person. In fact, all of it is accessible to the lay person. However, the more you start digging into it, the more you start finding richer nuggets. And this is where the scholarship uh, or the scholarly work you know, comes into play. And may Allah gives us, give us as much of this knowledge as we can possibly mine for ourselves. And may Allah elevate our understanding of the Quran so that we may ourselves begin to and continue to, continue to live our lives under the guidance of Allah. And may Allah increase us all in knowledge 
and give us wisdom. And that is, you know, to give us the ability to apply this knowledge. Wisdom is knowledge applied in the moments when it needs to be applied. And may Allah give us uh, knowledge and wisdom in spades. I mean, Allahumma, I mean, I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and from you, for you and to the rest of the Muslims. So ask Allah for forgiveness. Allah is the forgiver, the most merciful. Uh, mighty brothers and sisters, let us pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides our hearts towards him. May we all find the strength to stay firm on the path of Allah and may Allah forgive all our shortcomings. ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن زرياتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوحاب ربنا عليك توكلنا وإليك أنبنا وإليك المصير ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنة للذين كفروا واغفر لنا ربنا إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإلا لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنا كنا من الخاسرين ربنا آمنا فاغفر لنا وارحمنا وأنت خير الراحمين إن الله يعمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لعلكم تذكرون لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين